Yeah, so these are four different uh, interesting projects that I've been talking to over the last months or longer, um, who have all encountered the topic of uh, measuring value and contributions and uh, trying to develop alternative models to do that. And so um, I guess I'm going to really briefly just say one word about each of you, because the idea is that we actually uh, go right into the discussion about some of the different topics that we just discussed. So um, right here next to me, I have uh, Murad from Thanks and Share. Um, it's a network that enables founders and contributors to share equity in their companies. And so they're just getting started, actually. So uh, yeah, it's uh, very interesting to hear about that vision. Um, then we have Derek from CoBudget, who's also a member, uh, or this organization is part of the Inspiral Network. And it's a tool for collaborative funding and participatory budgeting, which we share also has started using. Then we have uh, Claudia from Cocoon Projects. They've been developing very interesting frameworks on liquid organizations and uh, also use value accounting, which is one of the uh, methodologies that we've also been experimenting with. And then we have Chad from Gratapay, which has um, developed an interesting system. Uh, it's an open company, and uh, they enable payroll and payments for people um, through their platform, where people can actually also set their own salaries. So they, they've run some interesting pilots on that. So thanks, guys, for being here. Thanks for having us. Um, so to start off, um, we had a really interesting conversation, actually, a few weeks ago. And so I think we came to one really important starting point that I think we need to sort of share with everyone, which is it seems like all of us have been exploring alternative ways of value measurement. But there's sort of this question in the room, which is like, why? Because somehow I feel like often also at events like this, we all are sort of in a similar mindset, so that why, we just say, oh yeah, of course, we all know why this is important. But I think that it's maybe good that we all share and think about, yeah, why is it, it what, what is it personally that brought you to exploring these alternatives? And uh, yeah, let's just get started on that. Any uh, volunteers? I think Derek looks like he wants to start. <laughs> <laughs> I think Derek raised the question, so he should go first. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I've, I've been volunteered. Um, Cool. Well, uh, I can share the ins uh, a bit about Inspiral's journey to doing uh, collaborative funding. So basically, the, the story goes, the mythology of it is, uh, at Inspiral we have this sort of uh, collective of people who are giving voluntary contributions uh, into a central pool, and then want to figure out, okay, how do we use this money to further social, uh, ben socially beneficial projects and uh, empower the people inside the community to build the commons? Uh, and initially the way that we dealt with this was, okay, we'll have a small crew of people who are going around and kind of figuring out what might be best and talking to people and kind of trying to facilitate discussion around these, uh, how we could use this money. But ultimately, uh, this cr crew, which was uh, called the support crew, was, they were making the decisions about the money. Uh, and in Spiral, we sort of have this uh, meme about uh, trying to create structures that distribute money, information, and power throughout the community. And the realization is just that, you know, these five people or whatever making these decisions about the budget is, is a huge uh, self-reinforcing loop of uh, centralization of money and power and information. And so the group fired themselves, and we started experimenting with uh, different ways that we could allocate the budget to a wider group, and ultimately kind of came to this uh, participatory budgeting solution, which has been, we've been iterating on since as well, but uh, the basic idea is, you know, let people choose where the money will go, and uh, hopefully we'll learn over time, as we do this more and more, what kinds of things are of value to the community, and uh, yeah, and this is an ongoing experiment. Thanks. Claudia? Yeah. Um, today, yeah, I'm Today, <laughs> I um, share with you um, the experience uh, that I, I have in Cocoon Projects. Um, the governance of Cocoon Projects is based on, uh, on this model called Liquido. And one of the four um, pillars uh, on which we are, uh, our governance is based is the contribution accounting. The contribution accounting uh, is not a tool to measure the contribution. In fact, when you t before you mm. told it's a problem in, uh, for, mm. for some people to, mm. to be measured, and 
yeah, uh, uh, many people think the same. But this, this tool, uh, we, we discovered using it. Now uh, we, are, we have been working with uh, Liquido for five years. That uh, the, the most important value is the, uh, the growing of people. Because it's a way uh, to have feedback on gra very granular tasks. Um, you can choose in our, in our governance, you can choose in which task you can enter because you think that you can bring your value, your contribution. Uh, just, uh, this is this an important step because uh, no one tells you what you have to do, but you choose in which task, in which uh, work item you can enter and contribute. Then all the people measure and evaluate the task. And this is a, a, a sign of a power for people. And then after the task is disclosed, people shared the values among the people who participate to contribute to the, to the task. And in this way, you can see how much you evaluated yourself and how much the team evaluated yourself. So it's, it's an important feedback for you. You can learn uh, about you uh, are um, uh, contributing, you are managing your time, you are uh, you're about your uh, efficiency, about your capacity of communication. For us, the important thing that we learn using contribution accounting is the feedback, the power of feedback, mm -hmm. and the, the possibility to grow, really grow. Yeah, that's a really interesting point that I definitely like to go into later on as well. Um, but maybe let's, I just, one uh, additional question in terms of the why, like, wh what actually brought you to start that model for a, yeah, was there any like frustration <laughs> with what there was before or? Yeah, yeah. We um, started to work uh, using uh, the Liquido uh, model, Liquido organization, because we wanted to work in a, in a different way. We wanted to, to involve people. We wanted to delete bottleneck. We wanted that the, um, uh, the organization uh, that uh, you, you live, you really live, is the same of the organization that you say. Mm -hmm. Because uh, it's important uh, that um, the, the true, the transparency in your, in your system. Mm -hmm. And we see, for example, that uh, the job interviews doesn't, don't, don't work. So uh, another possibility that we give to people is to enter in our organization without job interviews. It's a completely mm, different model. But I think that it isn't your question uh, to know about Liquido because <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. it's very dangerous. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Chad? Thanks. Um, right, so the question is why does Gratipay do what it does? Mm -hmm. um, so Gratipay's mission is to cultivate an economy of gratitude, generosity, and love. Uh, and that's why we do what we do. Um, Love is obviously, and gratitude and generosity are pretty expansive concepts. There isn't a clear definition, uh, especially of love. What is love? Um, so the, the shorthand that, that we kind of use to start to unpack that uh, is, is an idea of freely serving one another. Um, and so that's what we're looking to build. We're looking to cultivate an economy in which, uh, you know, in which we're interdependent, in which we all um, yeah, freely serve one another, but obviously yes, that's, that's the tip of the iceberg, right? This is a, a huge expansive concept and uh, you know, if we find ourselves arguing about what love really means, that's a pretty good problem to have, I think. So <laughs> that's why we do what we do. Cool. Murad? The question is why. Um, to be honest for with you, um, it was not the initial uh, objective. My initial object, I, I don't have initial objective. The true story, I was um, working for a big company, I have a wonderful family, but I feel that I've missed something. And what I discovered is I miss creativity. And my initial objective is create a side project to express my creativity, what I could not do in my paying bills job. 
so I tried to launch my side project, which is a video game, sample video game. And I discovered the barrier to co-create simply with people. That's the main problem. How to co-create simply with people. And what I discovered, money is the first barrier. But when you ask a contribution for someone, what I get in exchange. So that was my first problematic. How to remove this problem? In the journey, exploring, interviewing, asking, reading, I come to this conclusion, this model, current model, is not fundamentally designed for creativity. So we need a new model for creativity. And uh, thanks and share <laughs> in the journey is born. Why thanks, why share, I will explain you. Thanks because it's the most universal word in the world to say simply mutual help, reciprocity. And share because anything could be sustainable without the financial autonomy. So that's why for us the both sides should be the same um, kind of money. To create simply and measuring contribution, may, I dislike this word measuring, but for the moment the linguistic imposes this word. <laughs> How to appreciate individual contribution in a common human adventure, which is a common realization. So the inspiration give us to my team and myself this word, thanks, simply and share because my background is financial background and I know that the value, the real value is in equity. And equity is just flu uh, cash flow, that's it. And we come to this conclusion to create simply on the base of thanks, but to be sustainable, we need to be able to generate cash to distribute it the more fair play and the more fair we can. And we try to design this solution. Okay, thanks. So I think that one of the best way to usually understand what new models could look like or to also um, talk about learnings um, is to sort of discuss things that didn't really work. So um, in WeShare we tried a lot of things. Uh, some of them that I just shared, and I gotta say, actually, there's a lot of things that have been quite uh, frustrating and difficult, also things that have worked. But so, it would be great if, if you have something, uh, each of you could maybe talk about something that you tried, that failed, uh, why it failed, and also maybe, yeah, what you decided then to do instead um, that actually did work. Who wants to start? <laughs> Claudia, go ahead. Yeah. Um, we try to work um, using the uh, continuous improvement approach. So step by step, we, we try to, to improve. But probably um, one of the uh, errors that we, we made in the past, and sometimes probably we are <laughs> making also now, is to create um, the, uh, to, to start the evaluation of big tasks. So if you uh, choose, if you create big task, uh, the task probably will be also longer. So it's more difficult to evaluate uh, the, um, the value of the task and then also the, uh, to share the, uh, the value among people. Because if you work, for example, for three months or four months, after three months, after four months, it's difficult to remember the contribution of people in the task. And so, uh, um, participate to the, to the sharing of the value of the credits in a good way, in a right way. So probably one of the things that we learned is to create small tasks and to work in with a, a very granular flow of activities. I think that... Mm -hmm. This is the most important thing that we learned. Very interesting. <coughs> Anyone else want to share? 
um, I can share that uh, this, is, this isn't necessarily like a individual failure, but more of an ongoing conversation and difficulty and challenge is, uh, so in our network we do a, we have this sort of, uh, and, and across many groups that are using CoBudget, there's sort of this, uh, you know, you share money. Everybody puts money in the center and you decide how to use it together. Um, and, you know, the topic of this discussion is distributing, measuring value, right? Uh, and I think the ongoing conversation that we have maybe every, like, three months or six months or something is, cool, we're, we're sharing money and we can transparently see where the money is going, but money is really, really not the only value that people are creating. <laughs> um, the, the community around Inspiral and I know the communities around the different uh, uh, projects and people and companies and businesses that are using CoBudget, uh, it's really, it, th there's a whole bunch of this invisible work I think that you spoke about so beautifully that uh, goes unrecognized and that, the, the particularly problematic thing is that that invisible work is often being done by uh, people who are uh, already being undervalued by an organization. Mm -hmm. So whether it's like the person who's doing administration who tends to happen to be women and not men, or whether it's the uh, person who doesn't speak up very loud and, you know, in co-budget would never propose a project because they, you know, maybe they don't feel that it's their place. This is something I don't think that we've solved at all and that mm -hmm. uh, is really an open question about any type of contribution valuing system or money sharing system or solidarity system in general is uh, how do you acknowledge the human factor as you, as you say uh, even at a, at a deep level like who cares for the community and, and who's supporting each other and you, no one's going to ask for money to support a friend in an emotional time but that's really what keeps culture together. Yeah, that's a key point. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. <coughs> Murad, do you want to Go ahead. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, my team and us defined in, um, that we have a priority to develop technology. But we have faced the great challenge to attract good engineers and to, because we all, we are the first user of Thanks and Share, we don't use money, we use Thanks. <laughs> so to bring in the adventure with us and engineers and developers. After long wait, and we have tried, and we decided finally to go rough and to pay to get the what we need. Because mm -hmm. today technology is also commodity, so you pay it, and it's the biggest, biggest failure we have faced. Because the lesson learned: money don't buy trust, don't buy engagement, don't buy result, but the belief value and sharing a purpose bring results. So failure is a failure if we don't have a learn. So that's uh, what I want mm -hmm. to share with you. Yep. So Gratapay has failed a lot. <laughs> um, sometimes really dramatically, often. Um, I had a VC tell me the other week, he's like, most companies only get to fail once. <laughs> I was like, thanks. <laughs> yes. um, yeah, but I, I uh, but I'd like to dial back to a failure that wasn't quite as dramatic, um, but actually picks up on a lot of what you were talking about in your last talk, mm -hmm. uh, Fran. The, uh, the first time, so Gratapay, um, kind of the most interesting thing we've discovered and the, the, big, the big thing we have to offer uh, is this take what you want uh, salary idea mm -hmm. so that everybody... Um, sets their own salary. There's no boss or there's no algorithm deciding. As you were saying in your last in your, in your talk, you know that moment. It's hard to set somebody's salary, right? To make that decision, that value judgment of somebody like, what is this person worth? Like as as a manager, as a boss, to make that decision. And when Gratapay started to you know have other contributors involved, I was like, yeah, I don't want to make that decision. And so um, we made everybody else responsible. Uh, for their own, for setting their own salary. But in the first uh, couple weeks that we implemented that, we actually had a system much more like Backfeed, uh, where everybody in the team was supposed to vote on everybody else. And it wasn't fine-grained in terms of like, here you're reporting your contributions. Like, the last thing anybody wants to do, like, do you keep hours? You know, do you keep a timesheet and have to report that to your company? Like, what I've had to do that is totally soul-sucking, you know? You have to use NetSuite, and you're like, ah! So, 
Um, the idea, so we didn't do fine-grained uh, transactional reporting of your contributions, but we did have this idea of voting on each other, right? And we tried that for a little bit, and we got into si some of the same kind of psychological, uh, you know, dead ends as you were discussing that, uh, you know, that, that's difficult for people to do, right? And it's difficult to build trust in a community and to build a community uh, around that idea of constantly judging each other. Um, and so that's, you know, so, so that, that failed. And out of that failure uh, came this idea of, you know what, let's just trust each other and give everyone the responsibility completely for setting their own salary, for valuing themselves, right, and, and deciding for themselves what they're worth in a community so everybody can see what everybody else is, is taking. Um, yeah, so that was a, f we, we, f we failed in the same way perhaps that you, um, you know, had a, had a rough time with backfeed and out of that came the system we've got now. So. Thanks. Yeah, so I think um, it seems like definitely a really interesting point, what you were just mentioning about, yeah, the invisible work or also people, if they have to assess themselves how much they're worth, right? People have really different ways of doing that. So I don't know uh, if you have any opinions or experiences on, like, how can we, what can we do about that? Because I think uh, it's also something, it's cultural, it's maybe familial, it has to do with your self-confidence and... I feel like we often uh, tend to then just reproduce actually the same model that we had before, just that it's uh, more informal. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, first of all, to put in place this kind of mutual judgment, I dislike this word judgment, name, but mutual feedbacks. You have to install a culture of feedbacks, which is what is the good feedback. And in Thanks and Share, we have put as first value, progress and excellency, which means an operating system and a mindset completely different of the be good mindset. What we construct as a feedback is how to make you improve and how to attempt to excellency, which is the aim of our community. So we have decided to not evaluate persons but the result of team working, and we do not evaluate behavior of person, but the behavior inside the team. And transparently, everyone has individually the responsibility to contribute to the general result. So by the general result, each one have to commit to improve and to make it possible. We don't judging, we bring feedback to improve and to be ambitious, to be world-class talent in the field we pick up in. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's important to underline that the, uh, the feedback is not on, on the person, but it's on, on her contribution. So uh, it's normal that sometimes we uh, contribute in a better way, and sometimes in a worse way, but the feedback allow you to understand how to, to improve. So um, the feedback is the base of, of your evolution. And if this, this point is clear, I think that uh, also the, um, the perception of the feedback is uh, is correct is in a would uh, it, it's open probably just this you want um, so what we found when we moved to the uh, take what you want where everyone sets their own take uh, is that there are imbalances that arise uh, and we went you know so we we piloted this for two years. Uh, so we have two years of real-world experience. <laughs> we had about 100 people on the Gratipay team itself using this. Um, and there were three instances during that time when we saw tensions uh, arise in the team. What, <laughs> the way it played out is that money became a source of information about the tensions in the team. Right? So mm -hmm. you kind of had the money level up here. It's like everyone's setting their take up here. But then there's the social reality of the team. And down here, like, everyone kind of knows you know, like, uh, can feel it, right? Like, we've got this intuitive sense in the tribe that it's like there's an imbalance in the force or whatever, right? That it's like this person's doing too much work and isn't taking enough. This person's taking too much and isn't doing enough work. 
Um, and you know, so there's some ranges and there's some give and take. So usually you operate in that, you know, in that sweet spot. But then occasionally it does happen that you know, something stretches out of balance. And the insight for us is that you don't solve that up here at the money level. You say, all right, time out, time out. We have a social problem. We have a team dynamics issue. Let's drop down here. Let's slow down, shift down, down shift to first gear and talk about the team dynamics and say, all right, like, why are you taking this much and you're not doing any work? What's going on in your life? Do you have a, you know, do you have some outside, you know, a family problem that you're dealing with? Do you have, you know, what are your circumstances? Are you mad ab about something? You know, whatever. You have that conversation, go through that tough emotional work of having that conversation as a team, and then this magical thing happens when the money rebalances, right? It, because everyone's setting their own take, so the money then changes you know, uh, to reflect the new social reality of the team. It was, it was, it was awesome. You know, it was, it, mm -hmm. it, what ends up happening then is that it's mutually, re it reinforces the trust on the team, right? Trusting each other with that money uh, and those decisions and then doing the hard work of actually working through the issues when they come up uh, ends up just building up the team in, in trust and, and, and thanks and sharing, et cetera, <laughs> right? Yeah. That's beautiful. It really is fun. Actually. Yeah, I, I really um, resonate with that because uh, we've definitely, we've actually used value accounting, as I said a few times also in our project teams, and it perfectly surfaces those tensions. And so my experience has just been that you need to have um, a framework in place to process those tensions. And so if you're not ready to do that, if the people aren't ready to do that, that's when you may just, you know, run into a wall and then not actually be able to learn from it. So I don't know if you have any like uh, advice or practices on how you've been able to sort of do those two in parallel, um, have have a way to actually process those tensions. So the two being processing the tensions and doing the value accounting. Exactly, okay. because it seems like they need to be thought in parallel, and often we're just sort of thinking of the one side, and not the social part. <laughs> Derek, how do you guys do it? <laughs> I think many, many different ways ac across projects and uh, techniques. I, I guess going, going to the very, very basics, it's like uh, I sense a alignment in you can only do this stuff if you are being transparent, right? Uh, you, can only, you can only have these types of self-organizing systems if people can sort of check each other. Um, and I guess the, the other, the counterpiece to that is having space for dissent. So how can you how can you hold a space? I, I, I love the story that you told because I feel like it's, it's such a great example of, uh, you know, addressing the root cause as opposed to the symptom mm -hmm. because yep. uh, if you were to just try to solve it at the money level, it would, the imbalance would still be there. It would just come up again and you have to create that space for people to say, you know what, actually, this is wrong. You're, you're taking too much or like you're not taking enough. Um, and I feel like that, uh, it's, it sounds really simple but it's, it's, it's really difficult. You have to have a community and a culture that, and a container that can hold uh, dissent and can hold argument and transform that dissent into positive progress, healing, learning, and collaboration. And, and I think mm -hmm. that there's a million ways to do that, but uh, none of them are easy. <laughs> Did you want to add something? If Claudia wanted to go. No, no, just one thing that I, I thought uh, during your, your speech. Um, the tool is, is very important, but it gives um, visibility to what is happening. Exactly. It's just this. So um, then um, if you want to have an impact, if you want to intervene in uh, the human systems, you have to approach with human abilities. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, the tool is uh, sure is, is very, very important, but it, it's just a tool. But so that's also why I wonder, do you think that this kind of system can work for everyone and for every type of organization, at least right now? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> so what do we need to do for that to happen, though? What do you think? Or would we, is that actually even something we should hope for? Uh, it's not something I hope for, okay. I don't think. We position yes. ourselves as an alternative, not mm -hmm. as a dominant system, and we don't want to replace the existing system. Mm -hmm. We are offering an alternative, and people who sharing our value, who 
think that co-creation, autonomy, and uh, purpose is most important that all the things like titles, like uh, money, like uh, renting, like I don't know why, they are welcome. But we know that it's not simple to make the switch between um, we are conditioned to be in the, this way and uh, we have to be uh, deprogrammed and reprogrammed. <laughs> so we know that we are not making a sprint, but are running a marathon. And we gave ourselves 30 years to really, really have a significant impact on the world. And we trust on us, we will get it. But it, it takes at least three decades. Yeah, we're going to have to solve some big problems within those three decades. Um, I guess I'll, I'll amend my no. Yes. With uh, uh, I think part of the reason that uh, I'm inclined, at least personally, and I know some people in the community uh, in, in Spiral that I'm a part of, uh, are inclined to build tech tools is partially so that we can create uh, little bridges. So uh, if you go into an organization which is you know, uh, a big global NGO which has 50 years of operating history and they've got a strict hierarchy and you, know, you do reporting every six months and you're probably failing miserably but you need to keep things going the way that they are otherwise chaos will break out. You've got this terrible problem where on the one hand you, you can't build a culture of self-management and, self and autonomy um, and, and so it, it's self-reinforcing, right? The hierarchy reinforces the disempowerment which reinforces the hierarchy and I guess uh, a part of the theory of change of some of the work I feel like that we're doing uh, is to say, okay, what if you, so Lumio, for example, like, what if you give your team a way to talk to each other online and make decisions about, you know, smaller things in the office? Uh, and over time, creating, okay, well, what if you create a process where you can include some of the stakeholders in your funding decisions? Okay, cool. So taking... <laughs> Ideally, taking little steps towards more a culture of autonomy, more uh, a culture and, and a practice, right? Because it's, it's this, uh, this balance between you can want to do transparent collaborative decision making, uh, but if you don't have the practice and the skills and the experiences doing it, uh, it might go really, really badly. <laughs> uh, to the question, um, do we want this to take over the world and, and be for everybody. I mean, the first thing, I kind of resonated, Murad, when you were telling your story about why you're doing this. Uh, you know, I found myself in a nice tech job and I hated my life, you know, and I'm like, this is ridiculous. This is like the worst of first world problems, right? Because I'm like way up here on the, on the privilege chart and it's like, and I, and I hate this. And so, like, I hate jobs. I hate having a job, uh, you know, but at the same time, you know, what the answer is to, to, to hit the, Silicon Valley home run and, and cash out and you know suckers see you later right like um, that doesn't feel right either so I like with Gratapay I'm just trying to build the world I want to live in right I'm just trying to to answer that own uh, feeling I had in myself that it's like all right this this doesn't work like I can't I'm not going to do this for the next three decades um, you know so what what is a system that I could uh, find myself feeling okay about living within and so it's really very selfish. <laughs> Is, is what I'm trying to say. Is the yeah. But so do you feel like that behavior change that's necessary, have you seen a learning curve within your own communities or groups? Or do you feel like there's some people that just get it and others don't? Or how, how has that been for you? One magical sentence I heard from my team. I miss the office. I want to <laughs> cut my holidays to come back to work and to co-create things and share. That's it. I can tell awesome. more than that. And myself, next um, past year, I was with people, person I love the most in this earth, my family, and I was like missing something. It's like a drug co-creating and sharing something, passionating you with people, loving people, supporting you, and it's just incredible sensation. So. That's uh, why <laughs> I cannot imagine something else. I'm selfish like you. <laughs> um, yeah, go ahead. No, no, 
Um, we are working, uh, we have been working Liquido uh, for six, for five uh, years, um, and we have uh, other organizations to evolve and to be uh, more um, on, on these three axes that are openness, leanness, and uh, inclusiveness. But we, uh, in, in our experience, we uh, discovered that uh, to this evolution is not for all the organizations. You have to be uh, ready for this organization, and you have to um, to um, to walk, to be uh, um, to to trust in this evolution. If not, it's it's very difficult to to evolve to grow for you, and probably it's not uh, the good way for you if you don't want. So we had about 100 people participate in our Take What You Want salary pilot. Um, so it's for two years, so definitely people adjusted and you know, behavior changed. I, you know, uh, we, it was new for us, right? So we, we weren't a community before. Like as you were trying with the backfeed experiment, you were bringing it, introducing it into an existing community. Um, and we saw some examples of that, but for Gratipay itself, yeah, people, it, it, people definitely did have to wrap their head around it, you know? I guess we did introduce it because I said we tried the backfeed thing for a little bit first. And it was an adjustment. Um, and that was actually, so I said there were three times when there was tension. One of them was pretty early on um, with somebody who set their take really high, kind of to make a statement. And it's like, oh, this is baloney, like blah, you know. And so we had to slow down and we spent like three hours on, uh, you know, on IRC. This is in the pre-Slack days. Uh, you know, uh, having it out, right? Like, what is this about? Why are we doing it this way? And we had some people... Um, who were actually some of the more introverted people, perhaps, you know, that, that weren't necessarily the ones that, that would have the confidence to go out there and take as much as they could kind of thing, right? Um, who said, uh, you know, this was, this was challenging at first, but I understand why we're doing this, and, and, and I've kind of adjusted to it. So we have, it takes, it takes leadership. It takes management. You have to have, you know, it, it's important to have, uh, y you know, people who, are louder and more obnoxious, noticing when somebody uh, isn't taking enough, you know, and uh, and just raising those issues. Um, Alana and, and Spiral's been doing a lot of good work about leadership in distributed environments, so I think it takes that. Yeah, if you had to think about, so like, if you're in an organization and you're thinking about maybe trying a new type of model, are there any kind of like criteria you think you have for, okay, this organization is ready, or these people are ready, or this is the right type of, yeah, starting point from which to do something? Because also in WeShare, for instance, we notice there's operations, and then there's projects or consulting, and it seems like the, uh, some of these value accounting models work well for consulting, but not so much for running operations, even though we're trying. But so I think that might be useful for people also in the audience who are thinking about uh, maybe doing something like this to know uh, what to think about. Mm, sometimes the organization tells us that they want to, to change. Then you work with them and it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> and in other case, they, they tell you that mm, they are afraid of, the, of change and other stuff, and then you work with them and they are very open to, to the evolution. So I think that mm, there, there is an, uh, an answer, but if you work with, with them, you can see very soon if their approach and uh, their openness is, uh, uh, is real or not. I think since share we, <coughs> we focused on entrepreneurs um, because they give themselves a chance to make their ID come true. So we are supporting them and we focus on entrepreneurs on early stage because we come as alternative to the classic models and they enjoy it because it simplifies a lot, a lot of difficulties because we bring a whole package. So that's our approach today, but we also discussed with groups trying to make innovation and with the fear of liberalization, trying to approach disruptive innovation and 
at least stay in contact with <laughs> maybe the future challengers of their business. But clearly we focus on entrepreneurs because they are the most open to change because they have anything to change. <laughs> so they have to start and it's a white paper. So mm -hmm. if we give them a lot of, in how can I say, experience, a lot of um, feedbacks, a lot of, uh, how can I say, a takeaway model, they appreciate it for, <laughs> so we invest on them. Any other thoughts, criteria, what organizations are ready? This is really early days <laughs> for this kind of thing. You know, so you need early adopters, right? Mm -hmm. We're at the, like right here on the curve of the diffusion of innovations, right? So an organization that is <laughs> probably <laughs> represented here in the audience, you know, somebody that's paying attention um, to this kind of conversation in the first place. And, uh, you know, somebody, I mean, you know, if, I, if I'm just kind of reflecting myself out there, somebody who finds themselves in a position of power but doesn't want it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and is like, uh, I, no, I don't actually want to set your salary. Um, you, you know, I don't actually, um, you know, want to exist in that old framework. Um, you know, if you're, if, you, if you're looking to kind of divest yourself of that control and, and push that out into your community of contributors, uh, you know, that would be the kind of person, I think, or the kind of organization. I think that if you're working in a really complex environment with really great people, eventually these questions will come up because mm -hmm. uh, uh, people want to do many things and will want to change their roles and will want to try different things and will di you'll have to create or distribute value differently based on what people are doing at a certain stage of their career or life or learning journey. and. Um, yeah, I love the, the invitation of if you find yourself in a position of power and you don't want it, uh, I guess it's, it's also if you find yourself in a position of uh, like positional leadership and you notice that it's the people are not thriving, that would be an opportunity to start experimenting with, uh, you know, li little bridges and seeing what happens. Uh, inevitably what is, ends up happening is tensions arise out of the more transparency and freedom you create, the more tensions are allowed to bubble up. And so if you, if you think that your organization or your community can hold that tension and transform it into something that can be, uh, you know, new, new seeds for a new culture and more productive culture and happier culture, then I think that it's a great time to be doing these types of uh, experiments. Yeah, Thanks. I agree because uh, the complexity awareness is very important because if you don't see what is, uh, uh, is happening, <laughs> probably you can't evolve. So thanks a lot, guys, for your very rich insights. Um, we're going to continue the discussion out on the Maif Terrace if you guys have questions. And uh, thanks a lot for uh, all your listening. Thank you for Hi, thank thanks you so much. <laughs>